Hello and welcome to today's webinar on understanding boundaries and jurisdictions, a key skill for family historians, no matter where your research takes you. My name is Ginevra Morse, Vice President of Education and Programming at American Ancestors and New England Historic Genealogical Society. I will be your moderator for today's program. This program is brought to you by the Brew Family Learning Center. American Ancestors and New England Historic Genealogical Society is a nonprofit organization supported by our members and donors. We provide resources and expertise in nearly all aspects of family history and are pleased to offer such programming for our members and friends around the world. Giving today's session is genealogist Hallie Borstel. Hallie has a bachelor's in history with minors in art history and German language and a master's in historic preservation. She joined American Ancestors in 2019 after several years of working in architectural restoration and preservation in New Orleans, Louisiana. Her previous work experience includes the New York Genealogical and Biographical Society, the West Virginia Railroad Museum, Museum and Bender Library at American University. While at the NYGNB, she was part of the research team who compiled the popular New York Family History Research Guide and Gazetteer. She is also a longtime volunteer for unclaimedpersons.org, assisting coroners in locating next of kin of deceased individuals. Her areas of expertise include 19th century America, Germany, New York, New York City, Norway, Italy, westward migration, immigration history, and descendancy research. So over the next 45 minutes or so, um, we're gonna be talking about boundaries and jurisdictions. And of course, understanding where your ancestor is living at a given time can be a loaded question. And to answer it completely, you need to know the broader geopolitical and historical context. And as records are most often arranged by place, the where becomes especially important for family historians. So in this session, Hallie will demonstrate how to research boundary changes and understand jurisdictional levels using maps, primary and secondary sources, and other records. And while most of today's examples will pertain to the, to the United States, the concepts and strategies that we'll discuss really can be applied to much of the Western world and beyond. Now, at any point during the presentation, feel free to type your question into the panel at the bottom of your screen. We'll address those at the end. There is a syllabus for this session that can be purchased from our online bookstore if you're interested. You'll find a link to that uh, downloadable PDF in your reminder emails, as well as in your follow-up email after today's broadcast. And I popped that into the chat earlier as well. We are also recording this event and starting tomorrow, you can freely go back and review any of the content from the presentation on our website and YouTube channel. So if you miss something on today's first listen or maybe you don't get a full URL, um, not to worry. You don't need to be taking copious amounts uh, furiously of notes. Um, you know, you can always watch the recording later. All right. So without further ado, I will turn things over to Hallie. Thank you, Ginevra. Uh, as Ginevra mentioned, we will be talking about place names, boundary changes, why those are important and how to research those. Uh, I will mostly be using American examples, but again, as Ginevra said, there's a few international examples in here and the concepts are widely applicable. So with that being said, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, first, I wanna talk about place names and genealogy. So a lot of the times when we're doing genealogical research, we ask location-based questions. And those might be about uh, questions regarding our family origins. So asking where did we come from or where did any event happen? Or questions having to do with location that apply more to our research or methodology. That is, where can I find the records? So where is that repository um, relating to any specific event in the family history? So that sort of implies, as I just said, that your research question is going to involve a particular place. 
You can also use places to refine your research questions. So thinking a little bit more specifically about events in your ancestors' lives, you might want to know something like, why did any event happen in the location that it did? Or what can we learn about a certain event by focusing in on that location? And of course, the place provides context for understanding your research subject. Uh, for example, asking, how did the place of residence affect what the person did or how they lived? Uh, and the second part of this is using that location of residence uh, in order to locate sources from that place. So one thing that goes into this is understanding different administrative divisions. Uh, records are maintained at different administrative level, levels, so you must know where exactly to look to find your ancestor and what you can expect to find there. And uh, as I was thinking about these administrative divisions, I started thinking first about, you know, how you write out an address when you're putting something in the mail and sort of expanded it from there because there are all of these different levels of sort of place name or location category, starting with the very small being the street address, going up through um, the municipality, uh, the county, the state, and the country. And there's a few others in between, such as the parish, which would really only apply to religious records and not civil records, and the region, which may or not uh, apply to any given record set. So a big part of understanding place name research, why it's important to think about this is because uh, your ancestor might never have moved off the same piece of land, but because jurisdictions or place names have changed, it looks like your ancestor moved. And you want to be sure you're making that distinction. Uh, and outside of the US, we see really similar levels of administration in most, pla most places. I do a lot of German research. Uh, so for example, in Germany, we usually have the Stadt, which is a city, which is in a Kreis or county in a Land or state. So that's really quite similar to our American system. Uh, and in Ireland, you have the townland in the civil parish in the county, all in the uh, country of Ireland. Now, it's difficult to say what administrative level keeps track of what type of records. This does vary from state to state and not even considering locations outside of the United States. But I have picked a few different record types and uh, put them up here in a chart to try and tell you where you're most likely to find that type of record. So at the small um, geographic division, that's the town or the municipality, you will likely find uh, vital records, tax records, and cemetery records, with the exception, of course, of cemeteries that are uh, owned by religious institutions. Those will be held separately. At the county level, you may find vital records if in that area they're not maintained at the town or municipal level as well as court, land, and probate records. There are a few exceptions to court, land, and probate being held at the county level. And if you've done New England research, uh, you may be familiar with those exceptions because the ones that I can think of off the top of my head are Vermont, Rhode Island, and Connecticut. At the state level, you'll also find vital records. Uh, if you need a certified copy of a vital record for whatever reason, you're going to have to get that from the state. And you'll also see that some land records are held at the state level, in particular state land grants. At the federal level, you'll see post-1906 citizenship records, federal land sales, for example, from the Land Act of 1820, or the Homestead Act, as well as military and military cemetery records. There are a few terms that I uh, wanted to point out that may come up throughout this presentation and that are very useful to know before you dive into some place name research. Uh, of course, there are a few more than just what I've listed here. But uh, the important ones, in my opinion, are to know what a parent town and daughter town are. So a parent town is the town from which another town is created. And the daughter town is the town that is created from another town. And this can also be applied to counties uh, as well. Uh, a town is annexed when land from one town becomes part of another. And a town or a county can become extinct. Uh, and that means it no longer exists as a legal entity. 
Lastly, I wanted to mention the terms incorporated town, uh, unincorporated community and census designated place. An incorporated town is one that has its own government and state charter. An unincorporated community, uh, like a town, has a specific name and sort of rough geographic boundaries, but does not have that county uh, or that town government. And a census designated place is similar to an incorporated community, uh, but it is a, a geographic area that is defined specifically uh, by the Census Bureau, which is why it is a census designated place. And I just have the abbreviation up here on the screen, CDP. So let's talk next about place name changes. So if the name of a place, be it a town or a county changes, uh, and you come across this while you're doing your genealogical research, that could really throw you for a loop if you're not expecting it. And we see that any level of sort of administrative division might change from the very small, very specific street name all the way up to a country name. Uh, and there's a few general reasons we can come up with for these types of name changes. Uh, we might see that name, names change when boundaries are redrawn or a new community is incorporated or disincorporated, or perhaps the population outgrows the original name. The name may change as part of a system of standardization across a larger geographic region or to memorialize a person or event. Another reason the names might change is simply to avoid confusion. And lastly, uh, we see often when it comes to country names that these are the result of a war or political regime. So as I mentioned before, uh, how do name changes affect research? Uh, well, knowing whether or not there was movement helps us determine where to find records. It also helps us determine migration patterns. So we'll be asking ourselves in the course of our research, uh, did my ancestor move or were boundaries redrawn? So I want to walk you through one example of this. And to do so, we're going to look in a minute at the 1883 Richardson map of New Orleans. And I'm going to show you two sections of this map. Uh, one shows you part of the 6th district and one shows you part of the 7th district. The 6th district of the city of New Orleans was annexed to the city in 1870 and it was formerly the city of Jefferson. And within the city, uh, within the 6th district, we see that there is a street called Upper Line and that um, was the western edge of the city of Jefferson. And in the 7th district, that district was annexed to the city in 1876 and it was formerly the town of Carrollton. We see that there is also a street called Upper Line in the 7th district and that was the western edge of the town of Carrollton. So here we have those two uh, sort of snippets from that 1883 map and I've zoomed in pretty close uh, so that you can read some of the street names. If you look on the left hand side of both maps, you'll see a street, a street called Upper Line. And because we are uh, so zoomed in, you can't really see that the, the streets are two distinct entities, uh, but they are, they're almost parallel to each other. They never intersect, one doesn't turn into the other or anything like that. So you can imagine that might be a bit confusing. So here again, um, I have another map for you and a bit more information. So what we've just seen, the town of Carrollton was annexed to New Orleans in 1876. That means that the town no longer exists. So when it's absorbed into the city, we now have two streets in different parts of the city with the same name. So you can see those two streets marked in uh, red and blue. So the red one, the street marked in red was in Carrollton and the street marked in blue was in Jefferson. Now they are both in the city of New Orleans. And we see that not immediately, but within about a decade or two of these annexations, there are some street name changes. 
So upper line in the seventh district becomes Monticello. That's the one that's marked in red. And upper line in the sixth district retains its name. Uh, Monticello is now the western edge of the city of New Orleans. Uh, upper line is the one that keeps the historic name, but the meaning of the name is kind of lost uh, because it no longer has that meaning that it's the upper line of the city. So here we have a, uh, another snipping from that map. And this digital version is actually really quite handy because you can see that it's been annotated. This is how many name changes are happening in the years right after the annexation of the city of Carrollton, uh, which is also around the same time that this map is first published. So here we essentially have new boundaries of the city and duplicate names. So some of them are changed in order to avoid confusion. So that's an example of how street names or why street names might change. Town or municipal names can also change. Uh, obviously, knowing where your ancestor lived is important. This helps us determine where to look for records and keeping track of the specific town where an individual lived can help us to differentiate individuals of the same name. Obviously, when a town is incorporated or chartered, it needs a name. Usually there's a settlement there before the incorporation or the charter. So the town may continue using the name of the settlement or a variation of that name, or the residents may choose a new name at the time of incorporation. Uh, if a town is annexed or disincorporated so that the town no longer exists as a legal entity, the town may be that town name may be retained as a neighborhood name or a post office name. So let's look at uh, John Hecker. In 1870, he's enumerated in Carrollton Jefferson Parish, Louisiana. And in 1880, he's enumerated in New Orleans, Orleans Parish, Louisiana. So we already know that the town of Carrollton was annexed in 1876. So by looking at some more information about John and about his neighbors, uh, I can see that John did not move between 1870 and 1880. The boundaries moved. So this means that before 1876, I'm going to look for John in Jefferson Parish. And after 1876, I need to look for him in Orleans Parish records, even though he has not moved at all. And as I mentioned, uh, the town of Carrollton hasn't existed for uh, 150 years or so, but if we look at modern maps of New Orleans that show neighborhoods, uh, we can see that that town name or that neighbor, yes, the town name still lives on as a neighborhood name. There's three different maps here showing New Orleans neighborhoods and all of them have some version of Carrollton marked. Uh, Counties are cr crucial to understand because their records are so important to us as genealogists. As I mentioned before, uh, in most states in the US, Courtland and probate records are maintained at the county level. Sometimes vital records are also held at the county rather than the municipal level. As I'm sure most or all of you are already aware, the county is that administrative division between the town and the state, sort of the intermediate. So we have Boston in Suffolk County in Massachusetts. In the United States, there are two exceptions to this county system that is uh, in Louisiana where they have civil parishes and in Alaska where they have boroughs. You also may come across a consolidated city county where both the municipal corporation, that is the city, and the administrative division of the state share the same borders, that is, their borders are coterminous, they're exactly the same. And a few examples of this are New York City, New Orleans, Denver, and Washington, D.C. So the creation of a new county usually reflects a growing state population. Uh, so the administrative responsibilities become too much for an existing county. And when we look back um, over the, the history of a state, we see that often a large county is formed at the time of statehood. And from that one 
large county, many daughter, daughter counties are formed. And by the time we get up to the present day, the original county may or may not remain in existence. And two examples of this are Tryon County, New York, which uh, quickly changes its name to Montgomery County, but it goes from being most of the western half of the state to just a very small portion of upstate New York and Augusta County, Virginia. And on the next slide, I have a map showing Augusta County. So this is a map showing the approximate borders of Augusta County between 1738 and 1770. So Augusta County starts uh, around the Blue Ridge Mountains. Staunton is a big city in Augusta County. Um, and if you look over to the left side of the map, you can see Augusta County continues all the way to the Mississippi River. Now, of course, we know that uh, today, there are several states in between Virginia and the Mississippi River. But this is, uh, you know, the original borders of the state of Virginia were so much bigger. Augusta County was kind of the western frontier and it just encompassed the entire western portion of the state. Now other territories and states got created, Augusta County got smaller and smaller and smaller. Uh, it does still exist today, but it is has very different boundaries from its original boundaries in the 18th century. So states like counties hold key genealogical resources, particularly vital records. Uh, unlike towns and counties, no state that I'm aware of has changed its name since achieving statehood. Uh, but we do see that boundaries for some states have changed since the colony or territory was established or since statehood. So some examples of this would be uh, the original charters for some of the early colonies Virginia, Massachusetts, and Connecticut secured land from the Atlantic coast to the Pacific coast. Uh, we see this tract of land called the Oblong goes back and forth throughout the 18th century from Connecticut to New York. And we see uh, at the time of the Civil War, Virginia cedes the western half of its state and we get the new state of West Virginia created. So here's an example of some of the um, early charters for Massachusetts and Connecticut, showing you just how large the original territory that technically belonged to each of those colonies was. Country names can also change. Uh, this is not so much of a, a big deal when researching uh, American family history, but it's certainly something to keep in mind when you are doing European research, particularly 20th century European research. So in Europe, those name changes uh, at the country level are more common and continue into the 20th century. Uh, we have the formal creation of modern European countries, of several modern European countries in the late 19th century. Uh, specifically, I'm thinking of places like Germany and Italy. And we see that World War I and World War II draw new boundaries and create new countries. This has to do partly with the policy of self-determination, which of course is a whole nother topic. Uh, but just a few examples to uh, sort of illustrate these are Czechoslovakia, which is uh, formerly part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, becomes a country in its own right in 1918. And in 1993, uh, that country of Czechoslovakia is divided into two countries, the Czech Republic and Slovakia. Or we have Dalmatia, which is part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire um, around 1815. That becomes part of Yugoslavia 100 years later at the end of World War I. And then with the breakup of Yugoslavia in the early 1990s, that becomes part of the new country of Croatia. Uh, another brief example for you about these European name changes. Uh, here we have my second great grandfather, Joseph Janicki. He was born in Bohemia, as the census records tell us, in 1868 and immigrated to the United States in the 1880s. So we can find him on the census records from 1900 to 1940. And there are a few different ways his birthplace appears on the census records. Three times it appears as Bohemia, one time it appears as Czechoslovakia, one time it appears as Austrian Bohemia. So if I'm trying to learn more about him, I really need to pin down what exactly Bohemia means. 
and uh, how it may or may not be different from Czechoslovakia and Austrian Bohemia. So how am I going to do that? Uh, I might check a historic atlas or map, an encyclopedia or a European history textbook. And in the next section, I'll talk a little bit more about doing that place name research. So moving right along, I'm going to cover some uh, sources for gathering information on name or boundary changes. And I've divided this section up into uh, two sort of subsections, one about primary sources and one about secondary sources. Primary sources are those created by our ancestors and their contemporaries. So these are historic documents. And ones that are particularly useful for us here are historic gazetteers, local histories, and maps. We also might be looking at secondary sources. Those are items that were created by historians or researchers in the more recent past. Those would be things like scholarly books or journals, collections of population statistics and demographics data, or more recent atlases, maps, and gazetteers. Let's talk first about primary sources. So I want to talk first about gazetteers. These are something I use a lot in my research. Uh, gazetteers are basically geographic dictionaries or directories. And you can have a gazetteer written at basically the national, state, or county level. You see a lot of these were published in the 19th century. These often contain geological or topographical descriptions of a place, list major roads and waterways, and contain a brief history. You'll also see that the settlements within an administrative division are listed, and there's often a discussion of boundary and name changes. The county level gazetteers typically contain a lot more information than the state or national gazetteers, simply because they're covering a smaller geographic region to begin with. And these county level gazetteers typically contain information on industry, dates of settlement, prominent residents, religious organizations, schools, etc. So here's an example of one of those county gazetteers. This is the Gazetteer and Business Directory of Monroe County, New York, and it was published in 1870. So on the left hand side, I'm showing you one page that contains the county history. So within this book, there is a county history, which tells us about sort of that uh, entity in general. And then we have the Gazetteer of Towns, where we get specific information about each of the incorporated towns within the county. And that example is on the right hand side. These towns are listed in alphabetical order, which is pretty typical. So we start off with the town of Brighton. And if we read through that paragraph, we see we get information um, about name changes and about boundary changes before we get into a list of specific settlements within the town. Uh, there's only one here in Brighton and it is also called Brighton. And then we get information about manufacturing and industries. This is very typical of those 19th century gazetteers. Now, this next resource is something I debated whether I should count it as a primary source or a secondary source. Uh, sometimes, you know, historians have to decide how they're going to categorize these things. I've stuck it in with the primary sources, um, but you could argue it's a secondary source. And this source is the US Board on Geographic Names. That uh, institution was created in 1890 with the goal of maintaining uniform geographic name usage throughout the federal government. Now they have a searchable database called the Geographic Name Information System or GNIS available online. It's got this kind of funky looking URL, which is up on the screen now. You can also get to it by just Googling Geographic Name Information System. So this is a resource that's useful to help you determine whether a historic name is still in existence, and if so, what level that name exists at. If a place is no longer in existence as a town or a populated place, you might see that a geographic feature or community structure retains the name. So here we have the uh, homepage for the GNIS search engine, and you can see here that I'm about to do a search. 
up in the feature name section, I've put in Carrollton, and I have gone ahead and chosen a state and county, which you do not need to do. Uh, on just to the right of that, you can choose the feature that you're interested in. I almost never insert a feature there, but you could if you were interested in doing that. So then we'll go ahead and send our query and see what results we get. So for Carrollton in uh, Orleans Parish, Louisiana, we get 18 hits. And you can see that these are uh, not just geographic features, they're also specific types of buildings or what you might think of as community structures. So we know that the town of Carrollton doesn't exist. We did see that uh, we have the neighborhood of Carrollton, but we also have a whole bunch of other features in the area. Uh, that retain that name. We have a populated place, a couple churches, a cemetery, a post office. So if, for instance, we couldn't find Carrollton on any map, we could actually use the longitude and latitude data from this system to locate each of these features and get an idea of what that neighborhood of Carrollton really looks like. Now I wanted to call out a few international resources that fall into this gazetteer category. Uh, there are gazetteers for places outside of the United States. There are gazetteers um, for a lot of other countries or regions of countries. These are some of the resources that I use often. Uh, and of course, there's many more and you can probably locate them by Googling, you know, the place that you're interested in followed by the word gazetteer. So one of these is the Myers Gazetteer of the German Empire, which is uh, the borders of Germany as it was around the year 1900. We have a similar book for uh, Austria-Hungary. And uh, the Myers Gazetteer is actually a searchable database. This book for Austria-Hungary, the Gemeinde Lexicon, is not a searchable database, it's just a digitized book. So that's a little bit more difficult to navigate. You can also find gazetteers for places like Ireland, uh, England, the British Isles, etc. And those are widely available online as digital books, for example, on Google Books. I wanted to show you one international example. So let's say I'm looking at a church marriage record. This one is from Boston and it tells me uh, the place of birth of the bride and groom. So of course I want to try and do research in those original records, but first I have to locate them. So I read here that the bride's place of birth is Wusten Selbitz in Bayern, which uh, is Bavaria in Germany. So I'm gonna go ahead and look that up in the Myers Gazetteer. Now here's the homepage of the Myers Gazetteer, pretty straightforward big search bar in the middle of the window. So I'll go ahead and put my query in there. And what I've decided to do in this case is do a wildcard search. So I've started with the first name or the first portion of the place name and then included that asterisk to give me a bunch of different endings. Uh, so I'll just scroll through this list until I see something that looks close to Wusten Selbitz. And I do find something that matches. Uh, the spelling is slightly differently, but this is this exactly what I'm looking for, I believe. And on this page of the Myers Gazetteer, I get information about uh, the administrative divisions that Wusten Selbitz belongs to, which will help me locate different types of records in Germany. Local history books can be another great resource for learning about place names and boundary changes. Uh, as this name suggests, these are books detailing the history of a town or county. This is another common 19th century publication. And just like the Gazetteer, you often get information about industries, dates of settlement, prominent residents, religious organizations, and schools given in a bit more detail than that Gazetteer will give you. Uh, these books may also provide you information on historic trends that can help you answer the question, why did my ancestor live there specifically? This is an example of one of those local history books. This is the Pioneer and General History of Geauga County, Ohio. So again, this book is divided up into chapters about each individual town. And quite similar to the Gazetteer we looked at for Monroe County, this kicks off with a description of the physical features of, a town, of the town of Auburn. 
Uh, from here, we get some more information about the history of the town. Uh, and I believe on the next slide, I have an example of uh, one of these little biographical sketches. So not necessarily going to help you with your place name research, but th these can be a great resource for getting some almost firsthand accounts about the lives of your ancestors. Most of these resources are pretty easy to locate. Uh, as I mentioned, a lot of these books <clears throat> came out in the 19th century, so they are pre-copyright and have been digitized. Uh, a query on Google or your favorite internet search engine for something like the history of Cattaraugus County, New York, will usually uh, give you a bunch of hits for books about that subject. You can also search within the family search catalog or general uh, library catalogs such as those at worldcat.org and on archive grid. Okay, next we're going to talk about secondary sources. So the first uh, <clears throat> item in the secondary source category is research guides and aids. You don't have to reinvent the wheel when you're doing genealogy research if you're trying to determine a uh, place name or boundary change if you're trying to answer a question about that. You can definitely make use of guides and aids created by researchers and historians. There are a lot of location specific genealogy guides that were, will already outline place names or boundary changes within that area. Uh, another thing that would fall into this category are our more recent scholarly history and geography books. And if you're interested in learning even more, I would urge you to check the footnotes of that book and see where the author gets their information from. There are also recent gazetteers that would fall more into the secondary source category rather than the primary source category. The Family Search Research Wiki, which uh, if you've watched any of our other webinars, you've probably seen us talk about this. Uh, this is a great resource for getting quick facts about different locations. I use it to find uh, information about counties a lot of the times and the dates those counties were formed. It's very easy. I can just type in a county name into that search bar and a page about that county will pop up. So here we have an example I put in Geauga County, Ohio. If I scroll down a little bit from the top of the page, I get this uh, really handy chart that tells me the beginning dates for major county record types. And right underneath that chart, I get information about the parent county, if there is one. So the parent county is the county from which another county was formed. This one, Geauga, was formed from Trumbull County in 1805. So if I have a family that was in Geauga County for quite a long time, uh, I may even want to look in the Trumbull County records in case they were in that area at that physical location before Geauga County existed as a legal entity. Another resource is the Red Book. Uh, this is <clears throat> this covers the entire United States and has information on the counties within each of the 50 states. For each county, as I'm showing, or for each state, as I'm showing you here on the screen, we get a chart that gives us the name of the counties, where their offices are located, what date the county was formed, whether there are parent counties, and then those record dates. So, very similar to the information that we get on the Family Search Wiki. Now that red book, uh, the page that I showed you on the previous slide was from a physical published book. The red book has also been turned into a wiki that you can access on rootsweb.com. So this is the home page for that wiki. And if we go to the next slide, I have another example of that same chart. So once again, we have all of the county names, their addresses, the date that they were formed, whether there were any parent counties, and then the county record dates. So very handy information if you're looking for uh, quick information about a specific county in the United States. Now this is a location specific research guide and gazetteer. This is the New York Family 
History Research Guide and Gazetteer published by the New York Genealogical and Biographical Society. Um, I'm showing you Monroe County here. We looked at that historic gazetteer for Monroe County a little while ago. Uh, within this specific guide, we get uh, all of the sort of relevant information that we need to sort of understand where Monroe County fits in um, the geography of New York State and also in the timeline of New York State history. So we see up in the top right corner of that first page, we get the date the county was formed. We get information about the uh, parent and daughter counties and the county seat. And then we get this chart that tells us information about each of the towns. So uh, rather than those historic gazetteers that gave narrative histories of the towns, we get a condensed timeline for each of the towns. And I wanted to just bring in one quick example. Uh, let's say I'm researching David Close and I find him in several early census records. In 1810, he's enumerated at Northampton in Genesee County, New York. In 1820, he's enumerated in Gates, Genesee County, New York. And in 1830, he's enumerated in Greece, Monroe County, New York. So my question, of course, is did he actually move between 1810 and 1820 and then again between 1820 and 1830? Or have the boundaries simply been changed? So I'm going to check that uh, New York Family History Research Guide and Gazetteer and see if I can figure out my answer. If I look at the uh, section on the town of Gates within Monroe County, just by reading through this quick little timeline, I can see that Gates is formed as the town of Northampton in 1802. And it doesn't change its name to Gates until 1812. Okay, so that explains the 1810 census. And that explains the 1820 census as well. Uh, and then I keep reading and I find that uh, Monroe, the county of Monroe, is formed from the county of Genesee in 1821. And then the town of Greece is formed from the town of Gates, which is now in Monroe County. So there we go. That explains the 1830 census. So it looks to me like David has not left that same piece of land, but names have changed and boundaries have changed, which makes it look like he has moved a couple times in this brief period. I wanted to point out a few more international resources for you. These are three online databases that I would consider secondary sources that might help you locate places uh, in other parts of the world. So the first of them is Kartenmeister, which covers Eastern Germany and Poland. The second one is Jewish Gen Town Finder, which includes uh, Jewish communities in Europe, North Africa, and the Middle East. And if you are doing Jewish research and are struggling to locate a town, uh, this is a really handy tool because a lot of the times, if you look at those immigration records, you do get a town name, but it's been butchered or completely misspelled. And with the Jewish Gen Town Finder, you can do a bunch of different types of searches kind of the way you can do a Soundex search with a last name. They have options for things like um, phonetic matches, and then they have something called a fuzzy match, a fuzzier match, and a fuzziest match. So there's a lot of options on that Jewish Gen Town Finder for how to search. Uh, and then irishtownlands.ie is a really helpful website if you're trying to locate a specific town in Ireland. So just to address one question you might have right now, which is what happens to records when boundaries change, there's basically two things that can happen. Uh, the old records can be sent to the new administrative division or jurisdiction, so the boundary moves and the records move with it. Or the old records remain at the administrative division or jurisdiction in which they were created, so the boundaries move, but the records remain. Uh, so if you have questions about this, when you're working with a particular collection or looking for a certain item, I would urge you to always see if there is a collection description and read that description because it may tell you what the situation is. 
And here's one example that sort of covers both of those uh, possible situations. So this is the page from the New York City Municipal Archives, which shows what types of records they have. As you may or may not know, the city of New York, as we know today with the five boroughs was created in 1898. So we expect that the New York City Municipal Archives should have records for all five boroughs starting in 1898. Uh, but what we actually see is that Brooklyn records, which were created in the city of Brooklyn and the county of Kings before it was part of New York City, uh, those records got actually sent to the New York City Municipal Archives. So the boundary moved and the records moved. But for Bronx, Queens, and Staten Island, the uh, records did not move when the boundary changed. So there are earlier records for the Bronx, Queens, and Staten Island, but they're not housed at the New York City Municipal Archives. Okay, I also want to talk to you about maps. Uh, I really enjoy looking at maps. I think they're a lot of fun and they can be helpful in genealogy. Uh, using maps can help you piece together your family puzzle. You can uh, use them to visualize the land on which your ancestors lived, provide context for the surroundings, use them to follow family groups through the years, or locate travel and migration routes. There are quite a few different types of maps, and I'm going to talk you through several of those over the next few minutes. The different types of maps that may be available to you depend generally whether your research subject is urban or rural. Some of these you'll see only for urban locations, some of these you'll see only for rural locations. Uh, these are the map, type, map types that I will be talking about in a bit more detail. Cadastral maps, which show land or property ownership, topographical maps, which show geographic features, uh, insurance or real estate maps, also called Sanborn maps, ward and enumeration district maps, land surveys or plat maps. I do not have an example of a road map because I figured everybody knew what a road map looked like, but there's a place for those in genealogy research too. And I would urge you when you start looking at maps to consider the purpose of the map and ask yourself why it was created and who created it. The first type of map that we're going to look at is a cadastral map. This one is from a small village in Bohemia, which is now part of the Czech Republic. Cadastral maps show uh, specific parcels of land. So each of the lines on this map designates the boundary, the legal boundary of a parcel of land. And often these land maps uh, will show ownership as well. So on this map in particular, we see numbers rather than names. So we would have to go to the land assessment and use that as a key to understand our cadastral map. Uh, but the main takeaway here is that cadastral map shows us those specific property lines. The next map that I have for you is a topographical map. Uh, this one shows the area just north of Boston, Massachusetts, and this is from 1903. So you may be familiar with topographical maps uh, and thought perhaps that there wasn't, you know, any reason for a genealogist to look at a topographical map. But a lot of the times topographical maps do show more than just the geographic or physical features of the area. We do see that elevation lines are marked on this map as well as water, uh, bodies of water. But we also get railroads, um, ro regular roads, and even buildings. So this isn't something that would be super useful for an urban area. There's probably other maps that will show us more detail for urban neighborhoods. But for a rural town, a topographical map can be a good way to locate a cluster of houses or a particular road. The next example that I have for you is a Sanborn fire insurance map. These are a lot of fun to look at. Um, this one is black and white, which you will sometimes see with the digital copies, but often these are uh, in color and they are color coded. The fire insurance maps are really useful when you're doing property research because they do show each individual building. Now, these were created by a fire insurance company as part of their risk assessment. So you aren't going to see these for rural areas where the buildings were spread out and the risk of fire is much lower. Uh, 
this is again a map of New Orleans. We're actually looking at the Carrollton neighborhood again. And you can see there's some annotations on this map, even though this one is not color coded. So there, the buildings are uh, designated either a dwelling with a D or a shop with an S, or they have some other sort of title. For example, we have a school and police station here. Uh, and we really do get the footprints of the building. So this is a really cool way to sort of compare historic property data to maybe what you see on Google Maps or Google Earth today. The next type of map that I have for you is a ward map. A ward map is um, a map that shows the boundaries of city wards. And the wards are usually created for uh, as election districts. You'll also see that uh, the old census records will often refer to a person as living within a particular ward of the city. You can often find descriptions, narrative descriptions of ward boundaries in newspapers or city directories. But if you're a visual person locating the ward on a map, um, will probably make a lot more sense to you rather than trying to read that description and sort of follow it yourself. Next, I have a survey. Uh, this one is from Wayne County, Michigan. And surveys are pretty similar to the cadastral maps that I showed before because they're supposed to show the lines of specific plots or parcels of land. We see a lot of these survey maps created by the General Land Office as the western part of the United States is uh, the land is divided up, sold off, and settled. You also might come across thematic maps. These thematic maps can be any of the maps that I just showed you previously. Um, but they focus on a specific subject. And these can be both historic primary sources, that is items that are contemporary to our ancestors, or more recent secondary sources created by historians or researchers. I have one example of a thematic map here. This one shows markets in New Orleans in 1880. So every black square you see on the screen is the location of a public market. Uh, so that's kind of the precursor to the grocery store. So uh, if you're interested in you know, the history of food in New Orleans, or you want to know maybe where your ancestor was able to buy and sell food, this kind of map could help you answer some of those questions. And here we have another thematic map. This is from the same year, actually. Uh, this one shows Boston in 1880. And this one is color coded to show us several different types of institutions. So on this map, we have hotels, apartment hotels, libraries, schoolhouses, and churches. There are quite a few places where you can find historic maps online. The Library of Congress has a fantastic digital map collection, and that's on loc.gov. Uh, David Rumsey has uh, perhaps even better historical map collection, and his maps span, you know, from the medieval period up to um, the 20th century, and they he has maps from around the world. Old Maps Online is another good resource. Uh, USGS Topo View is a website that has um, both digital versions and downloadable versions of topographical maps from the United States from the end of the 19th century up to the end of the 20th century, I believe. So those are downloadable and you can actually download a file and open it in Google Earth and it will overlay uh, with the specific longitude and latitude of, you know, the, the historic location will be marked We'll have the markings of the present day location. So that's a really cool thing that you can do. Uh, some other good online map collections are the Perry Castaneda Library at UT Austin. That's not Texas specific, does cover the entire world. Uh, the Norman B. Leventhal Map and Education Center at the Boston Public Library. Again, not Boston specific. Then there's the uh, Newbury Library Atlas of Historical County Boundaries. Uh, at Newbury.org and the interactive county boundary maps at mapofus.org.
So I want to show you what exactly this Atlas of Historic County Boundaries can do and how it might help you, uh, especially if you're a visual person. So this is the homepage of the Atlas of Historical County Boundaries. And here we see the entire United States and we can click on the state that we are interested in. So I've chosen Louisiana. We've been talking about it a lot today and we're just going to stick with it. From here, what I want to do is see the interactive map. And this is the interactive map page. You can see on the right, we have a map uh, of the United States with a boundary outlined. And on the left, we have a list of dates. So whatever date is highlighted in blue is the map that we will see on the right hand side. And this other box sort of in the middle of the page is going to give us some information about that. Uh, we haven't technically selected anything, so it's not giving us any data here. Um, but I can we can click through and see a few um, more examples of this. So here we have I've chosen 1812, which is shortly after Louisiana becomes a state. And if I were to hover over any of these counties, uh, I'm hovering over Feliciana County right now. Um, we get some information about what dates those specific boundaries were in existence and the border changes that happened. And you can get similar information from map of us or map of us.org. Uh, we can see the boundaries of the United States change by clicking through these dates on the home page, or we can select a specific state and see uh, a similar display for the counties and how those boundaries changed. <clears throat> Uh, there are some other types of secondary source maps that can be useful to us as genealogists. So there are a lot of maps that were created recently to help us understand historic trends. So I've just shown you two examples of that. Um, but there are also more recent maps that actually show historic transportation routes or migration patterns. There are two really good uh, published resources for this type of map. One of them is Charles Pollan's Atlas of Historical Geography of the United States, which was published in 1932. And there's also the Kerry Eldridge Atlas series, which came out between about 1998 and 2006. Uh, why might you want to look at one of these resources? Well, it can help you place your ancestor a specific individual and his farm, his small piece of land in greater context. And also, if you're trying to track migrations, these types of publications can be helpful in locating possible travel routes. So this is just the title page for one of Carrie Eldridge's maps. This one is an atlas of northern trails westward from New England. So the only thing she talks about in this book is uh, travel routes, migrations out of New England, and she illustrates them all on maps. And here's an example of one of those maps. This one shows major pioneer trails from 1775 to 1850. If you're wondering how your ancestor got from you know, point A to point B, this type of book can give you an idea of how they might have done that. And we get some similar information um, from Charles Pollan's book, this one. He, uh, this series of maps, he shows us how long it took to get from basically uh, the East Coast from New York to points further west. Uh, a lot of the times, you know, we try and imagine how our ancestors did certain things. How long did it take them to move from Boston all the way out to Ohio? Well, this type of map can help us answer that question exactly. This book was published in 1932, as I mentioned before. So you'll see that the last one is rates of air travel circa 1930. And it's telling you that it takes, you know, a whole day to get out to California, which we know is no longer the case. It's also fun uh, in that way. Okay, I believe we are on our last slide now. So just a few final points, things to keep in mind as you're doing research on place names and boundaries. Uh, it can be helpful to shift the focus away from an individual to, to a place to help break down the brick walls and provide context for your family's story. Uh, as I mentioned many times, knowing if a person moved or if the boundaries simply changed does make a difference in whether, you're, whether or not you're able to locate records. 
You can also use a particular location to refine your research question and locate relevant sources. All right. Well, thank you so much, Hallie. So I know we're at time, but we're, um, I know that there are uh, some questions that came in, so we are going to go a little bit over. Uh, but before we get to your questions, I do want to share with you just some of our programs that are coming up in December, especially if you are interested in learning more about the history of the American Revolution and the American Civil War and your ancestors possible role in those conflicts. So starting on December 1st, Chief Genealogist David Lambert will be leading a three-week online course on researching Civil War ancestors. On December 2nd, esteemed historian Mary Beth Norton will be moderating a conversation with author Julie Flavel on her book, The Howe Dynasty. And then on December 7th, continuing with our exploration of the American Revolution, Ryan Woods of American Ancestors and Catherine Algor of the Massachusetts Historical Society will be in dialogue with best-selling historian and Pulitzer Prize finalist H.W. Brands on his process for researching and writing history with a special focus on his newest book, Our First Civil War, Patriots and Loyalists in the American Revolution. And then on December 9th, senior archivist uh, Judy Lucy uh, we'll share some of the family correspondence, photos, diaries, and other manuscripts in the R. Stanton Avery Special Collections and the Weiner Family Jewish Heritage uh, Center that represent uh, both the Union and Confederacy sides of the Civil War, the concurrent slave trade, contemporary women's voices, and the following era of Reconstruction. So join us for these and many other programs in December. And to register for those programs and to see our full calendar of offerings, just visit AmericanAncestors.org slash events. All right, so let's get to some questions. We had a few questions about gazetteers, Hallie. And uh, the first question is, who typically authors these gazetteers? Uh, that's a great question. I can tell you that Mr. Hamilton Child went around writing gazetteers as his, you know, only career, it seems. A lot of the times it is, you know, something, uh, you know, somebody would find writing gazetteers, that would be their niche of what they would write and publish. Um, I don't think there's any common thread as to what these people studied beforehand, um, but you will see these same names, uh, child, French, et cetera, popping up over and over again when you start looking at a lot of these gazetteers. And also, where do you typically find these gazetteers? Are they at libraries, archives, historical societies, map centers, all of the above? Yeah, so all of, the, all of those institutions will probably have at least one type of gazetteer for that specific area. If you like using uh, the internet to locate digital books, there are a lot of them available online. Um, you know, your favorite digital book website, be it Google Books, HathiTrust, the Family Search Digital Library, or archive.org will probably have some or will definitely have some gazetteers. And you know, you talked about jurisdictions and Barbara has a question about um, the relationship between a town and a village. Is one smaller than the other? Are they on the same kind of jurisdictional level? What's that relationship? So the difference between a town and a village, I believe has to do with the system of government. Uh, so there's, kind of these legal definitions for towns and villages. I know I personally think of a village as slightly smaller than a town, um, but actually the place I grew up, we were a town. Right next to us was a village that was exactly the same size in terms of geographic area and population. So that doesn't always hold true that the village is smaller. I will say that in the state of New York, I've mentioned New York many times in this presentation, but within the state of New York, you can actually have a village within a town. Um, so there are some quirks that vary from state to state as well. All right, let's see. Um, an interesting question from uh, Denise who asks about newspapers and, you know, are newspapers archived by the place? And I think that's a really you know, interesting question because newspapers, you know, they might be published in one area, but they could cover a large 
geographic region, it could be a national paper, it could be a more local paper. Um, so could you talk a little bit about kind of newspapers and the relationship to place? So newspapers, um, obviously a fantastic resource for genealogical research. And you'd be surprised how many small, you know, little tiny middle of nowhere towns had their own papers. Um, so in, in one sense, papers are very specific to that location, but in another, they're not. They cover a broader area. You'll often see newspapers um, in the 19th century in particular, they're copying reports straight from other newspapers. Uh, uh, I think one of the best things to do if you're interested in um, you know, finding what newspapers existed at any particular point in time is to go to the, uh, I believe it's called the American Newspaper Directory on Chronicling America, which is a section of the Library of Congress website. The URL is actually just chroniclingamerica.loc.gov. And you can find the, the US Newspaper Directory there. And you can put in a town um, and it'll tell you you know, if any newspapers were published in that town, what dates those newspapers were published and whether the Library of Congress holds any copies of that newspaper. Great, thank you. Uh, now, Stephen has a, a great question and this is something that I think we, we get this question a lot, um, especially when we talk about kind of writing up your family history. What's the appropriate way to indicate location name changes, you know, new communities um, when you're, ancestor hasn't moved, but it looks like they did. So how do you kind of um, capture that information in either your software, your research, your, your um, written work? If you're using a software program, um, I work with Roots Magic a lot. Uh, a lot of those software programs will actually prompt you when you enter a place name as to whether or not um, that place really existed at the date that you have entered. So for example, um, I've been working on a project in Roots Magic uh, with early New England, so pre-1776. And every time I enter, you know, Massachusetts or Rhode Island as the state, it wants me to add a country and it prompts me to say, you know, British North America. So if you are really concerned with um, being specific and being consistent, and you're working with a software program, you can follow their prompts to sort of make sure that you're capturing accurate data about locations. If I'm writing a narrative, I will often do something like um, say in parentheses what the change was. So for example, um, you know, this family moved to Pittstown New York, and then in parentheses, now the town of Richmond, something like that. Uh, it's a lot more flexible if you're actually typing this all out yourself, um, but I would definitely try and indicate those changes to keep track of what's going on yourself. Uh, and I think something simple, just putting it in parentheses with the word now, or if you want to do it the other way, put, you know, the family lived in Richmond, New York, originally called Pittstown, you could do it that way as well. All right, maybe just a few more questions uh, before saying goodbye. Um, we have uh, one question about, uh, you know, do you have any suggestions for how to determine the boundaries of a CDP? And a CDP being, well, remind me what a CDP is, <laughs> a census designated place. Place, yep. perfect. Yep, census designated place. I believe the boundaries is, census designated places are actually available on the Census Bureau website. Uh, so everybody here probably knows that this, all the census information that we really, really want, those names of everybody in the household, that takes like 72 years to become public. But what you may not know is that the demographic data is available pretty soon after a census is taken. So you can go in and get general population statistics and information about those CDPs from recent censuses by going to the Census Bureau website. 
All right. Well, thanks again, Hallie, for a really informative session. Um, you know, much of this information, knowing where your ancestor was at any given time is extremely important for us and, you know, to move forward with our research. So thank you again for your presentation. Um, unfortunately, that's all the time that we have for today. But if you have more specific questions about your family history research, you may consider hiring our research services team, for which uh, Hallie uh, is a member of. Um, or you can use our expanded chat service. Uh, the chat service puts you in direct communication with a genealogist. It's free, open to the public. And uh, that is Tuesday through Saturday, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern time. And it can be accessed at AmericanAncestors.org slash chat. And um, again, there is a syllabus for purchase uh, that goes along with this presentation. If you'd like to uh, purchase that, you can go to our bookstore. I'll be sharing that URL and that link in my follow-up up email to you later today. But of course, this presentation was also recorded, and you can freely access that on our website. So if there's something that uh, may be a full URL that you didn't um, get on today's first listen, you can go back and watch and pause or rewind <laughs> the recording. So thank you again for joining us. As you leave the event, you'll have the opportunity to fill out a survey and give us your feedback as we continue to expand our webinars and online offerings. Any and all feedback is extremely helpful and appreciated. This free webinar was made possible by the generous support of members and friends around the world. Please consider making a gift to American ancestors to keep these programs free and to create more free programs for you and for others. If you'd like to access more how-to resources or learn about upcoming online educational programs, please visit our online learning center, AmericanAncestors.org slash education. Best of luck in your research, and I hope to see you at our online programs in the future. Goodbye for now.